Welcome to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, and life. This is Maria Liberati. Happy May. We're celebrating the month of May with, let's see, strawberries. And uh, it's also the month of celiac awareness. So we're going to be highlighting some gluten-free recipes. And also, let's see, it's National Kitchen Design Month. So we're going to also have this month, stay tuned for some expert um, design professionals talking about, you know, making your kitchen a work of art and redesigning your kitchen and sometimes doing that on a budget. Today's guest will be Jennifer DeSalle, who is the host of Art Curious Podcast, and she's going to reveal some really interesting facts about the painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, which is this wonderful painting of all this beautiful fruits and vegetables and more. But it's so, it's a picture of what's to come in the months of May and June. So Jennifer's going to share some interesting facts about that. And then we also have, as a special guest, we went all the way to Tuscany and I interviewed Julia Scarpaleggia and she's going to share with us. She's a cookbook author and she's going to share with us some gluten-free Tuscan recipes. And I have always some recipes to share, so stay tuned. And before I share my gluten-free recipe for a coconut cloud dessert, I just want to remind everyone that I am doing, let's see, on May 8th, I have a virtual cooking class. It's a Tuscan picnic. It's especially themed around Mother's Day. So that's on May 8th. And you can register for that on eventbrite.com. And there's some giveaways for those attendees. I think we're giving away some copies of my books. If you register, you'll be registered. If you register for the event, you'll be registered also for that. And then at the end of May, May 28th, since May is the strawberry month, month of strawberries, I'm doing an event titled strawberries and cream so i'll be doing some recipes with fresh strawberries and this is definitely the month of strawberries and again you can register for that event on eventbrite.com you can go to my website marialiberati.com and you should be able to click a link on the front that takes you to the link on eventbrite.com but if you go to eventbrite.com you should be able to find the events just register for those events we had so much fun we did an event for Easter and uh, we had people from all around the world attending it was a really nice event we did it on zoom the events will be on zoom and I also want to remind everyone please share any recipes from the podcast share the photos of the recipes once you've created them hashtag them the Maria Liberati show and you'll be entered in a drawing that we do every so often to win a copy of one of my books, but we will also be compiling your photos and putting them on my website. So don't forget to share your photos, you know, hashtag the Maria Liberati show with the photo of the recipe you've created. And also just by sharing and liking episodes of my podcast, you are entered in a giveaway to win copies of my books. And stay tuned because we will be having different giveaways also from some of the companies providing products all month long. So please stay tuned. I want to congratulate Arlene Kilch of, uh, she's from Texas and she won a copy. She was last month's giveaway winner. She won a copy of the basic art of Italian cooking, Da Vinci style. We dedicated the whole month last month of April to Leonardo Da Vinci. So thank you, Arlene, for your shares and likes of the episode. And I think we have one more copy to give away to someone. So we're still looking for that winner from Instagram and Facebook. We're going to be giving a copy away. And don't forget, you can all also get your copies of my book series, the Gourmand World Award-winning book series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking at marialiberati.com, on amazon.com, at Art of Living Prima Media.com. That's the publisher's website. And really anywhere online that you can find books. You can also find uh, my videos on my Roku channel, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking by Maria Liberati is the name of the channel.
channel and my YouTube channel. Just look up my name, Maria Liberati. And I wanted to share, as I mentioned, a gluten-free recipe, but it's part of um, my blog. And you know, this my blog is being turned into a book series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking Diaries. So uh, stay tuned for that. That will be coming out in September. But I wanted to share, this is part of my blog. Um, the recipe is also, and it's a, a, a travel story that is from a little town that I visited in Italy. So as the old saying goes, he who seeks what they should not finds what he would not. There is a little paese or town in the province of Viterbo, which is in Umbria, Italy, that should be called the true magical kingdom. From far away, this town looks like a vision in the sky, something out of a dream, an ancient place where it seems as though all time has stood still. Civita di Bagno Reggio. Embarking on a day trip around Umbria seemed like it might be quite uneventful. Though it is a beautiful part of Italy, I assume that I would see many of the same beautiful churches filled with frescoes and rolling verdant landscapes. Surprisingly, I felt as if I was suspended on a cloud while spending time there. There it was, this seemingly magical walkway to the sky. This is how you get to Civita di Bagno Reggio. If you decide to visit at Civita di Bagno Reggio, you may enter by bus from Orvieto. The coach rail buses provide transportation for a small fee. The bus leaves from Orvieto's piazza, main piazza. Then the bus drops you off in Bagno Reggio. From Bagno Reggio, a mini bus drives up to Civita. But if you want a really authentic experience and you prefer walking, you can actually walk up this magnificent hill and follow the main road and enjoy the breathtaking views. And here's my coconut cloud dessert, which reminds me of Civita di Bagno Regia. It's like a city in the clouds. And this serves, this is a gluten-free recipe. It serves approximately eight. So it's one cup of rice flour, one cup of coconut flour, three quarters cup of sugar, four ounces of butter, five medium eggs, a teaspoon of baking powder, gluten-free, if you wanna keep this all gluten-free, one fresh lemon. You're going to need extra butter to butter the pan, a pinch of salt and some powdered sugar. Separate the eggs and set the whites aside. Be the egg yolks and sugar into a cream. Add in the softened butter. So make sure the butter is softened. That means you should leave it out at room temperature for a few hours before you do this recipe. Don't melt the butter in the microwave or anything. You just want the butter to be softened. You're adding in the softened butter to the egg yolks and sugar, and then you're going to also add the lemon zest. So you're going to zest that fresh lemon, and you're going to beat this mixture again. In a separate bowl, you're going to sift the flours and the baking powder all together and put that in a separate bowl. Once you have that all sifted, you're going to add in the egg yolk mixture a little bit at a time. In another bowl, you're going to beat the egg whites with a pinch of salt till the peaks form, firm peaks. Then you're going to fold the egg whites into the egg yolk flour mixture. And you're going to butter and flour a square around eight inch cake pan. Now, everyone that knows me and, and listens to my recipes knows that I don't always butter and flour a pan. A lot of times I just use parchment paper instead of the butter and flour. It's so much easier and you can just pull the parchment paper out and you'll pull the cake out. You don't have to worry about it sticking. So you can either butter and flour the pan and of course if you're going to flour do it with gluten-free flour or you can just fit a piece of parchment paper on the pan, pour in the batter, and you're going to cook this at 350 degrees, preheat the oven to 350 degrees for about 40 to 45 minutes. Enjoy. And we're here today with Jennifer Dassel, and she is the host of a really neat podcast, Art Curious. 
And if you're like an art uh, buff or, or someone that really enjoys art like me, you'll find it really, really incredibly interesting. And Jennifer also has a book out. But this month, the month of May, we are touching especially upon strawberries, but all the fresh produce that's out there. And Jennifer is going to share some interesting facts with us on this painting that you may all know called the Garden of Earthly Delights, where you see all this wonderful fresh produce and other things and all this fresh produce that comes to mind now that we're getting into spring and summer. Jennifer, hi, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yes, well, we're excited to have you. Um, and Jennifer, tell us the name of the artist that did this Garden of Earthly Delights. This is an artist who would be considered somebody in the Netherlands today. So his name is Hieronymus Bosch. And this is a work of art. I think he was active probably about 500, almost 550 years ago now. So it's uh, pretty much around the Renaissance or right before the Italian Renaissance up in the north in Europe. Yes, yes. Wow. That's what, so if anyone look, wants to look it up, they can also look that up online. I'm sure they can find it online. So tell us, I know there's a lot of interesting facts and you're the one that always finds all these neat, interesting things. Tell us some interesting things about that painting. So it's called a triptych. So a triptych is basically a three paneled work of art. Uh -huh. And if you think about it, uh, the first panel is basically like an Edenic paradise scene. So you're thinking about heaven, the beginning of, of mankind and, you know, in the Christian thought and Christian religion. Right. The central panel is, I think, the titular garden of earthly delights. So it's really considered very earthly. And that's where you get these incredibly lush scenes of amazing uh, just vibracious flowers and fruits and vegetables and animals and humans are kind of gallivanting all around the scene. Uh, and really, it's really funny because there's just about hundreds of figures, but they're all really tiny and everything that they're around is big. So they have these amazing lush, fresh strawberries oh. that are giant. So oh. thinking about the abundance they're in. And then it's sort of thinking about um, if things get a little out of hand in terms of that Garden of Earthly Delights, what happens if you're on the wrong side of the uh, Christian law, for example, and there's a hellscape in the third panel. So it's like you've got Eden, you've got Earth, and then you've got hell. It's a really interesting work of art. And it's actually got a lot of humor in it as well, which I think is really fun. Yes. Yeah, so tell us, I know that you were telling me some funny things, so tell us. There's in the, I think the hellscape in particular, it's like you think about a lot of images that painters have done of hell over the many centuries, and some of them are quite gruesome, understandably so. But Hieronymus Bosch, I think he wants you to think as much as he wants you to laugh. So he includes some really interesting things in the hellscape that are, for example, some giant musical instruments, which I think is really interesting. So music plays a big part for some reason in his whole his whole triptych. Uh -huh. But one of the things that I thought was really fun is that probably about five or six years ago, a music student at a university in Oklahoma was looking really closely at this painting one day and she realized that there's this little tiny figure that is laying flat on his stomach and you only really see his rear end and on his rear end are musical notes, like just actual musical notation written. And she was a music major and she looked a little closely and said, you know what, I think I could probably transcribe this into modern day music, how we would actually write music out. And so in the middle of the night, she actually did this. Uh -huh. She transcribed it on a computer program and then released it on her blog. Yeah. So a few years ago, and then it just took off. And so people around the world started tuning in, really loving this very bizarre song that she found on this little man's bum. And they started recording it in their own styles, like Gregorian chant and heavy metal, and people wrote lyrics to it. And even people like Anderson Cooper talked about it on their TV show. And uh, it became this very strange worldwide phenomenon just because it was so funny. Um, but, you know, unexpected also. I think people take art very, very seriously in so many ways. And it's nice when art can sometimes be a, a, a cause for a laugh. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, and I think if people, more people took it in an entertaining way, there would be more people 
you know, enjoying art and it would be kind of a little bit more mainstream. And I think that's what, well, that's what podcasts, like what you're doing definitely brings art more, you know, more mainstream so people can understand it. But it sounds like the Garden of Earthly Delights is definitely a painting that you could, you know, you could just sit and kind of stare at. And it's something that is, as you were saying, some paintings for hell, they have these gruesome sites, but that does not. So it's something you could stare at for maybe a couple hours and just yeah. kind of analyze all the little different, find all the little, it's kind of like a, an adult version of Where's Waldo, you know. With exactly. Waldo. That's what the, it sounds like. Absolutely. That's how I refer to it also. And it's one of those things where I think even if you're an art historian like me or someone who has really looked at this painting a lot over the years, the decades, right. you still see something different every time. And there's always something that'll catch your eye and that you'll enjoy in a different way, I think, even right. um, as you come to it at different points in your life, different life experience. It's quite fascinating and it's a big painting it's uh -huh. in the Prado the Museo del Prado today in Madrid Spain mm -hmm. so if you get the chance to go there I mean there's a lot to look at for sure yes, definitely I'm wondering if, it, if they are online too you might be able to yes to see that online now because all, a lot of museums are online so we definitely yeah. need to check that out definitely but uh thanks for sharing that with us so Jennifer, tell us about your book. I know you have your book there. I do. Yeah. So this is, this is my book. It's called Art Curious, Stories of the Unexpected, the Slightly Odd, and the Strangely Wonderful in Art History. And it came out last fall. So it came out in September from, from Penguin Books. Uh -huh. And it is in many ways just inspired by the same kind of stories that I tell on my podcast, yeah. which is, as you mentioned, I'm trying to share stories about art in ways that aren't so serious and stories that maybe you would have heard outside of your typical art history classes if you're a college student who took art history classes or things that you might remember from going to a museum, for example. I want to tell you about Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, but I wanna tell you about when it was stolen in 1911 uh -huh. and why some people, including one of my art history professors, think that the one that's on display at the Louvre is a fake version. Um, so I wanna tell you things that maybe if you're an art fan, you may not have known, or if you're not an art fan, or you're just getting into art for the first time, yes. things that will make you maybe want to learn a little bit more and go a little bit deeper. Yes, which I, and I, I love it because it makes some art, it gives another level, another depth to art where it makes it more in, interesting. For me, it is interesting anyway, just looking at it, but for someone that yeah. might need another something, it adds another level of interest you know, to know all these backstories is kind of what I love to do with food. I love to bring, you know, the history and these backstories to different recipes and things like that. So you do that to art, which I love. I think that's really, really interesting. And everybody can hear you on Art Curious, right? And I'm, I'm sure we can download that anywhere you can find podcasts. Is that correct? Absolutely. Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, the whole deal. So okay. and yeah. And website also? I do. It's artcuriouspodcast.com. There you go. Great. Yeah. Jennifer, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have you back again to share some more interesting facts about all these really neat art, uh, works of art. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. Thank you. And today I have Julia Scarpaleggia, um, who is, let's see, a food writer, a cookbook author. She teaches cooking classes and um, she specializes in custom cooking. And she's going to share, she especially is going to share gluten-free recipes, Tuscan bean gluten-free recipes, because this month, the month of May, is Celiac Awareness Month, and uh, we're trying to share gluten-free recipes, and uh, we do always do a lot of Tuscan stuff, so definitely wanted to share gluten-free. Julia, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Tell us, Julia, tell us um, the cookbooks that you have. Your, the titles of your cookbooks. 
Okay, so I have uh, five cookbooks. My first one, uh, my grandma's recipes, is in Italian and in English. It's a, uh, made by a small publisher here in Tuscany. Uh -huh. And now it's, it is out of print. It was uh, printed first in 2012. Okay. Uh, then, uh, the very same year, I had I Love Tuscany, uh -huh. uh, which is a cookbook about Tuscan food. Uh, Tuscany is my region. Uh -huh. And that book has been translated in English, Dutch, uh, Polish and Chinese from Taiwan and it Italian, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that was my first uh, proper big book, uh -huh. something I'm still very proud of. Yeah. Uh, then um, I had uh, two cookbooks uh, in Italian, just in Italian. Uh -huh. One is Cucina da Chef con Ingredienti Low Cost, which uh -huh. means basically how to cook like a chef with affordable ingredients, yeah. which is, you know, a very modern approach to cooking especially yes, now yes, yes. and then I have a cookbook on natural uh, recipes with fruit so that was part of part of a series of cookbooks yes and that's, that's great and I yes I did forget to mention so we're talking to you from Tuscany today yes. just gives you know not everybody can travel <laughs> so and I know I've been missing Tuscany so I'm in the U.S. so we can't travel there so it's a nice way also for my listeners to get to travel to Tuscany if they can yeah. go there. So, um, but yes, and I noticed on your website, your website, tell us your website again. It's, it's Jules Kitchen. Yeah. So J-U-L-S Kitchen. Uh -huh. uh, and it's my blog. Uh, it was born in 2009. So I've been blogging for more than 12 years now. Oh. It's in Italian and in English. Oh, that's great. And I noticed on your blog, you say that your recipes are based on your family's recipes. Is that where? Exactly. Um, I'm not a chef, so I'm a proud home cook. Yeah. So everything I know is thanks to my grandmother, my mother, my aunt, so my family, and yeah. thanks to cookbooks, because I'm also uh, a keen cookbook lover. <laughs> oh, wow, well, that's great. So I know we were talking before the interview, and you said you had some... Um, gluten-free recipes in mind mm -hmm. you'd like to share so and I'm, I'm sure our listeners would love to hear especially because they're Tuscan gluten-free recipes so why don't you tell us about those recipes so these recipes are great recipes because they are traditional uh -huh. they but they have a very modern approach and they are very authentic the first recipe uh, I want to talk about is torta di ceci or cecina yeah. It is a recipe from the Tuscan coast, uh -huh. from Livorno, uh -huh. uh, and it's basically a very thin chickpea cake. It's uh -huh. savory. It's called also cinque cinque, which means five and five, uh -huh. because it's a street food. So in the past, they would buy five cents of torta di ceci and five cents of bread. So this torta di ceci comes with bread or sandwich with bread. And now you can have it with um, grilled eggplants, grilled zucchini. Even I've seen this sandwich in a pizza. That's something that teenagers do now. <laughs> but it's a very uh, old and traditional recipe because Livorno is a port town. Uh -huh. So uh, chickpea flour was one of the best ingredients that sailors could bring with them when yeah. they were traveling in the sea uh, yeah. to have proteins because of course they couldn't bring meat but chickpea flour could be diluted with some water and then baked and that becomes a chickpea cake it is known as torta or torta di ceci in Livorno uh -huh. in Pisa which is a nearby town and they hate each other so Pisa and Livorno they've been hating since you know the beginning of times oh, <laughs> it is known as cecina so it has a different name yeah. So if you go to Livorno and you ask for Cecina, they will tell you, go to Pisa if you want Cecina, here is Torta. <laughs> that's, that's how they love their town and their tradition, you know? Yes, yes, so. yes. Oh, that sounds great. So tell me, so in other words, it's a street food that you can find sold in the streets there um, yes, you, in Livorno or Pisa. But yes, exactly. But of course, you can also bake this at home. Yeah. And this, uh, it's almost like a vegan frittata but because the texture of yeah. chickpea flour and water becomes like a frittata, an omelet. Yeah. So when you make this at home, okay. I usually add uh, vegetables inside. So it could be kale, it could be spring onions, uh, zucchini blossoms, peppers, whatever you want, and then bake it very, very high oven. Uh -huh. And it's delicious. So it, it's gluten-free, uh -huh. uh, it's vegan, mm -hmm. and it's good for everyone. Oh, that sounds delicious. That sounds really good. I know I've done the vegan omelet using chicken mm -hmm. flour, 
So uh, I've been trying to actually eat more plant-based. So that sounds delicious. Yep, that sounds it is, really, it is. really good. So yeah. um, yes, and it's gluten-free, obviously, because it's got the chiji flour, the chiji chi flour. flour. Exactly. So, um, so tell us what is, and, and also I just want to say, so you said you can use that in a sandwich, right? As a Exactly, as a exactly. Line. Yes. This is how they usually have this in Livorno. So a very soft bread, uh, like bread roll yeah. with the chickpea. It's a slice of chickpea cake inside and lots of black pepper. Sounds so good. Oh my gosh, you're making me hungry. <laughs> so, <laughs> what is, so tell us another recipe. So that, uh, this is something you could consider almost as a starter. And now let's close the meal with a dessert. Yes. This comes from the mountains. So we were on the coast. Now let's go to the mountains. Yes. Uh, and this is castagnaccio. Castagna yes. means chestnut. So castagnaccio is a chestnut flour cake. Yes. It is made just with chestnut flour, water, and then you can have extra virgin olive oil, rosemary, raisins, and according to where you are, walnuts, uh, pine nuts, mm, sometimes uh, orange zest, uh -huh. but that's all. No sugar, no flour, yeah. uh, no dairy products. So again, this recipe is vegan and gluten-free. It's, uh, it's an acquired taste uh -huh. because it has a very subtle uh, smoky taste. Yeah. Then you have the rosemary and the olive oil. So it's not the typical cake you would expect, you know, chocolate, cream and, yeah. and everything. Yeah but it's very traditional and delicious. And usually I suggest to try this with some whipped ricotta. Oh, so it's not vegan anymore, but it's still uh, gluten-free because some ricotta with sugar would really make the taste sweeter and more approachable. Yeah, it would complement. It would complement. Yeah. And that's a good idea because, you know, I've made castagnaccio and I've served it to people that, you know, were they didn't know what to expect. So I know yeah. in Italy, you know, everybody, a lot of people know Castagnaccio, but in the US and I had people, they just didn't understand what it was because yeah. it does have yeah. like sweet stuff, like raisins you put in it and nuts. But I think serving it with the ricotta cream, like you said, would be definitely a good idea because then it's kind of like a dessert type of a thing Ex but it's good because exactly. it doesn't have a lot of sugar and gluten. exactly and when it's christmas time i like to make uh, sandwiches uh -huh. so two discs of castagnaccio and uh -huh. in between i would put ricotta we put uh -huh. sugar uh -huh. and then candied orange peel and chocolate chips wow. so it's something in between the filling of a cannolo you yeah. know and the castagnaccio uh, I think it's very festive, also because it's very nice with some powdered sugar on top and the rosemary. Uh, so it's very nice and festive and still gluten-free. And it's still gluten-free and it's a way to have a canolo. canolo yeah. <laughs> free. So, but yeah, that does sound really, oh, that sounds delicious. That sounds really, really festive. So yeah, there you have it. So you can have a meal today with the the uh, chiji, the torta de chiji. Or the and castagnaccio. And then that for dessert, definitely. Yeah. It's a great gluten-free meal. Mm -hmm. um, Julia, tell us um, about what's coming up for you. Anything coming up? Or would you want to tell our listeners where they can find you? So um, at the moment, I'm working on a new cookbook. Uh -huh. uh, this time, it's with an American publisher, Artisan Books. Uh -huh. So the new cookbook, it's about Italian cuisine. I cannot uh, tell any more about this now. It will probably be out next year. And well, and then you can find me on my blog, julskitchen.com, and then all the social media. So uh, Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook as Jules Kitchen. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, and uh, hopefully we'll all be getting to Tuscany in person soon. Yeah, I really hope so. <laughs> yes, for now we'll send our, our uh, ciao and um, a presto what I should say. <laughs> yes. So, thank you so much. And I'm sure presto. To be back again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you bye so bye. much. Thanks for listening to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, 
and life. This is Maria Liberati. I'd like to first thank my producer, Britton Rizal, and also my special guest for this week's episode, Jennifer DeSalle, who is the host of Art Curious, and also Julia Scarpaleggia, the Tuscan cookbook author, and my production intern, Alexandra Troy. Thank you all for making this a great episode, and sign up for my May 8th Tuscan Picnic Virtual Cooking Class that's a Mother's Day theme in my May 28th cooking class. They're all virtual cooking classes. The May 28th one is strawberries and cream to get us ready for the picnic holiday seasons coming up, you know, Memorial Day and summer. And uh, it's such a wonderful month to celebrate strawberries. So sign up on Eventbrite. You do have to register for the classes. Registration is limited. They're virtual. They're done on Zoom. Register for the classes through Eventbrite. If you have any questions on the classes or registering, you can always send an email to info at marialiberati.com but you should be able to find them on eventbrite.com or marialiberati.com. You can look up if you're interested in finding any more recipes or my culinary memoir cookbook series. You can find those at marialiberati.com, artoflivingprimamedia.com, and anywhere books are sold. And that's my cookbook series, the Gourmand World Award-winning cookbook series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking, Holidays and Special Occasions, Second Edition, and The Basic Art of Italian Cooking, Da Vinci Style, and The Basic Art of Series, which is The Basic Art of Cocktails, The Basic Art of Coffee, The Basic Art of of creating a Tuscan wedding, the basic art of pizza, the basic art of Christmas dinner, the basic art of pasta, and the basic art of experiencing Venice. And soon in September, my blog will become a book called The Basic Art of Italian Cooking Diaries. The first one will be called The Basic Art of Italian Cooking Diaries Seasons. And that will be released in September. And I know we'll be doing some giveaways for the book release. Stay tuned because as mentioned before, we will be doing some giveaways of my books. And again, if you share pictures of the recipes that I uh, talk about in my podcast, episodes, share a photo, post those on your social media accounts, hashtag the Maria Liberati show, or just share and like any of the podcast episodes, you will be uh, entered in a giveaway for some of my books. So we are doing giveaways. And thank you so much for listening. And again, you can find me at marialiberati.com on Twitter at Maria Liberati with a capital M for Maria on Instagram at Maria Liberati and on Facebook at Chef Maria Liberati and on LinkedIn at M for Maria, M Liberati. Until next week, peace, love, and pasta.